Hello, everybody, and uh, whatever your time zone, and welcome to this uh, joint ISN KDGO session of the WCN 2021 in Montreal, but held in the virtual mode. My name is Michel Jadoul. I'm a KDGO co chair and I have the privilege to chair this session. We have today three top experts. Uh, as speakers, each of them as uh, co-chaired a KDGO Controversies Conference. And the title of the session is Getting the Basics Right. And I'm happy to introduce the first speaker who is Professor Carol Pollock from the University of Sydney, who is probably best known of the kidney community because of her work in the ideal trial published in the New England Journal. And her title today is Dialysis Initiation Prescription and Modality Choice. Carol. I'm delighted to participate in this session, which is a joint session with KDGO and the World Congress of Nephrology entitled Dialysis Initiation, Prescription and Modality Choice. I don't have any specific disclosures, but I should acknowledge that I was co-chair with Christopher Chan, along with colleagues at the uh, KDGO uh, controversies conference and I'll be drawing on slides from colleagues uh, at this conference and although Maria Slon isn't acknowledged here I have uh, accessed uh, many of her slides. So if we consider uh, the issues that are important I've listed them here and I won't go through them, but I think uh, the overriding issue is that we need to be focusing on goal-directed choices for patients and their families and do our best to be able to provide them. So I'll discuss each of these issues um, in turn. So if we look at factors that impact on the commencement of dialysis in general, they're largely not medical factors and they're largely uh, economic and system factors for an individual community. And again, uh, I won't go through this, but there'll be obvious uh, concerning fragmentation of care, reimbursement, uh, workforce av availability, renal unit distribution, etc. We recognise that there's a large unmet global need for dialysis and renal replacement therapy. And although we can put in place um, financial um, improvements and insurance, we still recognise that there's inequities around dialysis initiation that need addressing. And so one of these inequities, for instance, is the um, uh, disproportionate number of males that commence dialysis compared to females, which in many advanced economies uh, is greater than uh, two to one. So twice as many males can uh, start, well, are starting dialysis compared to females. And although we recognise that there is a increasing risk of um, end-stage kidney disease in males, it's not two to one. So there are structural uh, inequities that need to be addressed. Now, I think that this is a very common uh, response that uh, nephrologists see when we mention dialysis to a patient or their families for the first time. Um, and it obviously is born out of poor uh, education, poor knowledge. So we recognise that people need to be educated about dialysis at a time when it's most likely to engage them, which appears to be at CKD stage four, which was a subject of a separate KDGO um, uh, conference. Doing education too early means people don't see it relevant to them. Doing it too late, they're too anxious to be able to take uh, the information. So there needs to be um, a sweet spot where uh, timely um, education is given and then we can make shared decisions uh, relating that to person and goal-centred outcomes um, within the constraints of whatever system we work in. And of course, the education and the discussions need to be culturally and linguistically appropriate. So if we consider goal-directed dialysis implementation, it really does move us away from this one size fits all approach, but it does require um, uh, a, a, an investment 
um, in education for patients and, and um, the entire clinical care team. We need to be better at looking at tools for eliciting, documenting, and uh, really our criteria for what are uh, excellent outcomes. Uh, we need to be flexible, um, and that isn't always easy in our dialysis scheduling. And we do need to um, change our metrics for success so that it's not based on mortality or hospital admissions, um, but based on the goals of the individual patients. Um, so I think that we need to then align the incentives across stakeholders that include the clinicians, the patients, the caregivers and the system. So when we're looking at the different dialysis modalities, we're all aware of the different types, um, in-centre satellite, home dialysis, be it PD, home hemodialysis, sometimes a mixture of them and a supported, supported care pathway, which um, shouldn't be a default uh, position, but an active decision. And in making these decisions, we need to consider um, you know, multiple issues relating to the system and personal resources, uh, how that might impact on patients, um, uh, you know, monetary uh, position, what infrastructure is required of the system and potentially for the patient, their comorbidity, uh, you know, do they have problems with access that might um, direct a one or another form of dialysis and, um, maintenance of residual renal function. So paradoxically, although in-centre dialysis is more expensive, it's more likely to occur in lower income countries and more likely to occur in people with poorer health status. Um, people who start uh, dialysis as a consequence of an acute kidney injury, albeit unplanned, are more likely to commence dialysis in-centre and stay in-centre. Satellite dialysis uh, may be appropriate for people who are unable to um, undertake home dialysis independently, um, and also for people that have significant issues with needle phobia or concerns about um, uh, being isolated. And of course, we all recognise that in many cases, the healthcare team has a bias for the type of dialysis. So home dialysis, be it peritoneal or home hemodialysis, results in uh, increased independence and flexibility about the delivery of the dialysis. That improves well-being, and in general, capacity is um, not an issue if dialysis is being delivered at home. So there's no um, constraints in terms of bed numbers or chair numbers in the uh, in the dialysis units. It's uh, delivered at uh, an efficient cost and it's associated with better outcomes and people are more likely to be uh, productive with employment and family interactions. So with home hemodialysis, it's also um, uh, able to vary dialysis prescriptions. Um, there does need to be uh, appropriate access, but access in general isn't um, uh, predicate or isn't a, a prerequisite for whether or not people can dialyze at home. So if we look at the variation in dialysis modality, it's enormous around the world. So if we look at Japan, hardly anybody has a kidney transplant. The majority are on uh, in-center dialysis and very few on PD. If we look at Hong Kong, uh, there's very many more people on PD, very much fewer people on in-centre dialysis um, and about a third of people with a transplant. If we look at the US data, you can see that there is an increase in number of people since the last decade who were dialysed with peritoneal dialysis, which reflects the, um, the home dialysis population. And if we look at this um, in terms of outcome, we can see that the five-year survival in the US uh, in people who commenced dialysis uh, with peritoneal dialysis in 2011 was 52% compared to the US, 
uh, uh, who com commenced hemodialysis where it was 42%. So a survival advantage in commencing peritoneal dialysis. Now, Australia has got challenges. Um, I've represented us here uh, at the top of the world rather than the bottom of the world. And I won't go through all the, the different challenges that we have that are environmental and, uh, and also um, some, well, your cultural challenges. But for the, the main, the important point about this slide is that we have nothing in the middle of Australia, which has um, really prompted us to have a very strong home hemodialysis program in Australia and New Zealand. And I recognise that Martin will be uh, talking about this um, in a later presentation. But it, suffice it to say that approximately 20% of our hemodialysis population in Australia and New Zealand under the age of 45 are on um, home hemodialysis. But this varies very much between units and some units have uh, up to 80% of their home uh, or of their dialysis patients on home hemodialysis. And that results in a very flexible um, uh, arrangement for how many dialysis sessions and how many hours they do per week. Now that results in an improved patient survival. So you can see here people on home hemodialysis at five years in Australia and New Zealand have approximately a 75% five-year survival. And I've mentioned to you um, in the US it's 42% on PD, 52% on hemodialysis and yet here we have a 75 percent overall survival on home hemodialysis and although there is some difference in the age range it's in general um, excellent survivals that i'm sure uh, martin will go into so this does allow a, a, a flexibility in terms of um, delivery of nocturnal dialysis which again is um, uh, resulting in better clearances, better outcome. Now, most people, when we're considering uh, preparation for dialysis want, dialysis, want to know where they're going to start. And there have been multiple um, risk predictors for when dialysis will be initiated. In general, I, I find these more uh, useful for population rather than individual predictions. Um, but I just draw your attention to this publication by Navdeep Tangri, um, which is worthy of, uh, of consideration. So when we look at preparation for uh, initiation of dialysis, we really need to consider uh, our assessment of the patient, which is really a holistic assessment, no longer just based on kidney function, requires multidisciplinary input, uh, and I won't be considering people that there needs to be a uh, maybe a different considerations for when dialysis is started. And they're people with failing grafts, the pediatric population and patients who are pregnant. We, we need to very um, be very cognizant of access and timing of access creation. Um, and that access creation to be consistent with the patient's choice of modality. Um, in general, we like a fistula first approach, but that's not um, ultimately uh, the answer for everybody. Um, and PD catheters should be placed at least two weeks prior to uh, a start of peritoneal dialysis. And we need contingency planning if um, dialysis access fails. So this um, is just a slide to remind you of our ideal study that was completed now over 10 years ago, um, demonstrating that uh, if we start people on dialysis earlier, they have no health benefit, either in terms of mortality, infection, uh, or cardiovascular outcomes. So really people need to be started on dialysis when they are symptomatic with uremia. And uh, I think, you know, when we look at the data that has suggested that there was an increasing number of people starting dialysis with EGFRs of more than 15 mils per minute up to when we 
published the um, the findings of IDEAL in 2010, you can see that that's now plateaued and decreased um, in the US data. Um, we also know that this observational effect of worse outcomes in people who start dialysis early still persists. So there is no benefit in starting dialysis at a higher EGFR. When we look at people who do start dialysis, it could can be emergent. They need to immediately start dialysis because of hyperkalemia, volume overload, etc. Um, and generally that needs to occur with a temporary catheter via hemodialysis. Um, but then there needs to be also a contemporaneous uh, discussion around if dialysis is deemed long-term, is hemodialysis or PD appropriate? Now, urgent dialysis can be planned or unplanned and people may or may not have had prior education. And if PD was the modality of choice, then we should be starting them urgently on PD. Similarly, if people have unplanned dialysis, haven't considered which modality, we should be agnostic as to whether or not PD or hemo may be the best option. So if we are considering urgent start PD, there are system requirements, there are patient requirements. And it's basically around the ability to place the peritoneal catheter within 48 hours and appropriate protocols being in place for the staff. Um, that depend on uh, the basically the baseline uh, residual renal function and the size of the patient, and that then dictates the um, the schedule and the prescription for urgent PD. But when we look at the outcomes, they're comparable for urgent start PD and hemodialysis, um, and there's fewer short-term complications with urgent start PD. Now, with hemodialysis, people need to be aware that the um, likelihood of uh, an, an uncomplicated access um, procedure is about 60-65%. Um, so about a third of people need stage procedures or repeat procedures, um, and people need to be aware of that. So if we look at the access complications, they um, are more likely to occur with a graft, um, less likely to occur with a fistula, and in the um, intermediate position is uh, a, a catheter-related complications. But when we look at patient preference, um, people are generally happy with a catheter more so than with a fistula, Although when they were asked if they were um, would change the access type, um, people were amenable to changing the access type. So um, looking at optimal vascular access, um, you know it's not rocket science as depicted in the cartoon on the left, but there are multiple issues that need to be considered um, in selecting optimal vascular access. And although we all um, aspire to a fistula first program, it need not be the optimal selection for the individual patient. So then we come to the dialysis prescription and we've been um, really dealing with this marker of dialysis adequacy determined by uh, urea kinetics for over 30 years. But when we um, look at the data that um, has really uh, underpinned this, it was sort of, you know, stronger in the 90s. And over time, urea kinetic modeling hasn't really held up as a valid marker of dialysis adequacy. And so now we recognize that there is a, 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 a plethora of other considerations that we need to have in place to measure dialysis adequacy. And really um, adequate dialysis isn't enough what we really need is optimal dialysis that um, provides patients with uh, a good quality of life and an excellent life expectancy. So if we look at the dialysis prescription, it's likely that um, a longer period on dialysis is 
likely to be more beneficial. Um, and KT on V really is a minimum target. It's not an adequate or an optimal target. And volume control is going to be uh, addressed by Jennifer in the next session is likely to be much more important. High flux versus low flux, hemodialysis versus hemodiafiltration really doesn't seem to make a significant difference in mortality and um, targets for blood pressure, phosphate and quality of life really haven't changed over the years. So I think I'll leave this to Jennifer to discuss. It does seem that uh, fluid control is important. And when we look at the overall cardiovascular issues, there are issues related to removal of uremic molecules, but also issues that impact on cardiovascular outcome related to volume control. So adequacy of dialysis is very much um, a broader issue rather than urea kinetic modelling. I think just finally, we do need to consider residual renal function um, because that does appear to be strongly associated with an improvement in survival. And we need to be looking ahead to look at our unmet needs in our population, which consist of cardiovascular morbidity and mortality and our um, patients diminished quality of life and focusing on how we might be able to improve these. So um, ultimately, we need to focus on optimal dialysis. Um, and in conclusion, I've gone through uh, these factors, but we really need to reevaluate our dialysis approach, our prescription, if problems arise and be willing to change our, um, our dialysis um, prescription if it's consistent with patient goals and um, and aspirations. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. I think we will have some time for Q&A at the end of the session. So without further delay, we will immediately move to the second talk, who will be given by Dr. Jenny Flight, who is Associate Professor and Vice Chief of Nephrology and Hypertension at the University of North Carolina. So, and she will speak about the content of another KDGO controversies conference held two years ago about blood pressure management. So her title is Blood Pressure and Volume Management in Dialysis. Jenny. Good morning. I'm Jenny Flight from the University of North Carolina. I will be reviewing the conclusions of the KDGO controversies conference on blood pressure and volume management in dialysis. First, some disclosures. In 2019 in Lisbon, Portugal, KDGO convened a controversies conference on blood pressure and volume management in dialysis. Attendees hailed from all over the globe and represented diverse practice patterns in areas with very different resources. First, I would like to emphasize that this was a controversies conference. This was not a guidelines conference. We did not seek to develop guidelines or specific recommendations regarding blood pressure and volume management. Instead, the focus was on summarizing the evidence, exposing evidence gaps, and identifying future research needs in the space. The conference focused on four broad topic areas, blood pressure measurements and targets for individuals receiving maintenance dialysis, pharmacologic interventions for blood pressure abnormalities, the dialysis prescription, both HD and PD, as they relate to blood pressure and volume, extracellular volume assessment and management with a focus on technology-based solutions, and volume-related patient symptoms and experiences, as well as non-pharmacologic interventions for blood pressure and volume abnormalities. For this presentation, we are going to focus on blood pressure, specifically blood pressure measurements and targets, as well as pharmacologic interventions. However, I acknowledge up front that blood pressure and volume are intrinsically linked and it's difficult to fully disentangle them. First, blood pressure measurement. We have numerous options for blood pressure measurement and dialysis, ranging from pre and post and intra dialysis measurements. We can do standardized blood pressure measurements in the clinic, and then we can do home-based measurements when we ask the patient to do blood pressure measurements, or we record the blood pressure by an ambulatory blood pressure monitor. 
Ultimately, conference attendees concluded that home blood pressure monitoring was likely the best approach for diagnosing hypertension and other blood pressure abnormalities in individuals receiving dialysis. Specifically, home blood pressure monitoring is recommended by the American Heart Association and the European Society of Hypertension. Home blood pressure monitoring also correlates more closely with ambulatory blood pressure monitoring than either pre or post dialysis blood pressures. And it's a better predictor of both all cause and cardiovascular mortality when compared to peridiolytic blood pressures. So when you're trying to do a home blood pressure monitoring for your patients, the conference attendees recommended perhaps doing the measurements twice a day, preferably once in the morning and in the evening, recognizing that blood pressure patterns vary across the day and suggested doing this after the midweek dialysis treatment for those patients who are on the typical thrice weekly treatment paradigm um, for the reason that this would give you blood pressure measurements when the volume status was likely to be most stable. However, many conference attendees felt varying the day of the week for these measurements would also be appropriate. While this was a uh, consensus that this would be the best way to diagnose hypertension, some did question the feasibility of doing home blood pressure monitoring. In the blood pressure and dialysis in feasibility study, only 22% of the patients achieved more than four home measurements per month, calling into question the feasibility of this approach in large populations. However, providing some reassurance, a recent second pilot feasibility study of 50 patients compared home blood pressure measurements to pre-dialysis blood pressure measurements. And in this trial, across the four month period, 94% of the participants were adherent to home blood pressure monitoring, suggesting that may in fact, it may be possible. Thus to diagnose hypertension, conference attendees recommended considering using home blood pressure measurements instead of center-based blood pressure measurements. Now, what about blood pressure targets? Meta-analysis data show that lowering blood pressure among dialysis patients does decrease mortality. However, we also know that lowering blood pressure too much may have adverse consequences for our patients. So the question is, what is the right balance? The blood pressure and dialysis study included 126 patients with hypertension who are hemodialysis who were randomized to either intensive or standard blood pressure control. Patients in the intensive arm had more episodes of intradialytic hypotension and symptoms such as cramping and nausea and vomiting. Again, underscoring the fact that we may want to lower blood pressure in patients. However, it's not clear how low we should be aiming. Ultimately, conference attendees concluded that thresholds for blood pressure treatment and blood pressure treatment goals among individuals receiving hemodialysis can only be established on the basis of prospective randomized trials. And current evidence absolutely does not meet this standard. However, in, in the absence of high level data, di dialysis relevant evidence, it's certainly reasonable to extrapolate blood pressure thresholds and targets for interdialytic blood pressure, i.e. our home blood pressure readings from current hypertension guidelines for the general population. While the conference attendees felt that this was reasonable, they also emphasized the fact that an individual approach is necessary. And then when we're deciding our individualized targets and approaches to patients that we need to consider intra and inter blood pressure patterns during dialysis, aspects of volume management, patient comorbidities, particularly cardiovascular comorbidities, as well as the patient's frailty status, i.e., are they at high risk of having episodes of hypotension if we over control their blood pressure? Now, once we have diagnosed hypertension, the question quickly arises of when should we use antihypertensive medications in patients receiving maintenance dialysis? So there are two indications for antihypertensives in dialysis patients. The first is blood pressure lowering, and the second is for cardioprotection, particularly in the settings of a past myocardial infarction, congestive heart failure, stroke, or known arrhythmias. 
Her blood pressure lowering, the conference attendees felt strongly that the first approach to lowering blood pressure should be non-pharmacologic treatments. However, in many cases, if patients are still not at the blood pressure goal, despite efforts to reach uh, intravascular and extravascular eubulimia, then it was certainly reasonable to add in titrate doses of blood pressure medications. However, conference attendees felt that if blood pressure medications are interfering with volume management, i.e. making it difficult to remove fluid during treatments, the blood pressure medications should be reduced to allow for more fluid removal. When antihypertensives that were being used for the indication of cardioprotection, conference attendees felt that it was reasonable to initiate or continue blood pressure medications if they were being given for a cardiovascular indication. However, once again, they would not reduce ultrafiltration or the amount of fluid that was being removed to allow for titration or increases in those blood pressure medications. Ultimately, conference attendees felt that optimizing volume status takes priority over giving specific antihypertensive medications. The conference attendees also considered the importance of dialyzability of antihypertensive medications, um, but specifically they identified the evidence gap that there are no randomized control trials regarding dialyzability and outcomes. However, based on existing evidence, they felt that it was reasonable to consider intradialytic patterns with regards to dialy dialyzability of antihypertensive medications. Specifically, among patients who have intradialytic hypotension, to consider using dial dialyzable antihypertensives, and among patients who have intradialytic hypertension, consider using antihypertensives that are non-dialyzable. Regarding the agents of choice, conference attendees summarized the following. Medications considered first line in the general population, such as ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers, beta blockers or calcium channel blockers, should absolutely be considered uh, in individuals receiving maintenance dialysis. However, lack of quality evidence precluded the conference attendees from recommending any one particular agent over another. However, there were a number of considerations that they felt could be individualized based on the patient's status. Specifically, considering other cardiovascular indications for the antihypertensive medication when making a treatment choice, and also conference attendees felt that there could potentially be some preference given to ACEs and ARBs, particularly in the setting of efforts to preserve residual kidney function. And this was felt especially to be true among individuals receiving peritoneal dialysis. And finally, conference attendees felt that uh, the intradialytic blood pressure patterns um, with regards to dialyzability of antihypertensive medications were important considerations when choosing the individual agents. We invite you to review the manuscript, which was published in Kidney International in May of 2020. This manuscript summarizes the entire conference, including, vol including the volume management aspects. In summary, the controversy con conference attendees concluded that managing blood pressure in dialysis requires an individualized approach with integration of numerous clinical dialysis treatment and patient factors. However, they were substantially limited in actual recommendations that they could make and identified a clear need for randomized control trials and additional study in this area. Again, we encourage you to review the entire paper where you can read a list of recommendations uh, for research in this area going forward um, that apply to low blood pressure management, targets, and antihypertensive agent choice as well as a number of different aspects of volume management among patients on both hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. And with that, I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. As I mentioned, the Q&A will be at the end. Thank you for a very clear talk as the previous one. And without further delay, I immediately move to introducing to you the third speaker, who is Martin Wilkie from the Sheffield Kidney Institute, well known among others as the editor of Peritoneal Dialysis International. And he has accepted to speak about the 
the ongoing, because it's split in various uh, modules uh, held in the virtual mode, the ongoing home dialysis uh, KDGO controversies conference. Martin, thank you. Martin Wilkie, a renal physician from Sheffield. I would like to thank the organizers of the World Congress of Nephrology and also the KDGO team for asking me to participate in this joint session with KDGO. I'm going to cover an aspect of home dialysis. Here you can see the outline uh, of the talk that I'm going to give. Um, I plan to cover, to present a case of an individual presenting late during the pandemic. In other words, presenting with advanced chronic kidney disease requiring dialysis. I'm then going to give a little information around the context of the COVID-19 pandemic and its implications for dialysis patients. Then we'll talk about urgent start PD and cover some aspects of supporting patients on PD during the COVID pandemic, and then I'll wrap up. I expect this talk to last about 15 minutes and then for there to be about five minutes for questions. So here's our case. A young man presenting in April 2021 to our unit during the first wave of the pandemic with severe hypertension and advanced chronic kidney disease requiring dialysis. And indeed, uh, urgent hemodialysis is commenced using a femoral venous, venous catheter. But after discussion with the patient and his family, it's clear he wants to dialyze at home. And so the questions for us to consider are what did we need to do to get this person home on dialysis? But before we go there, let us consider, um, first of all, the relative advantages of peritoneal dialysis compared to in center hemodialysis. So I've put some of those on this slide. Clearly, peritoneal dialysis enables people to dialyze in the community away from the hospital. And during the COVID-19 pandemic, that was key because people were able to isolate safely at home. But during other times as well, being independent and in the community has got key advantages. It also reduces the requirement for travel to centers, as you can see, avoids the need for vascular access, particularly avoiding central venous catheters with the complications that they can cause. It is associated with better preservation of residual renal function in most studies. A recent systematic review um, by Chazuan et al, um, published last year, really confirms the better quality of life for peritoneal dialysis versus in center hemodialysis. So uh, across all of those studies, the, the um, distinctive, distinct evidence was in favor of peritoneal dialysis with respect to quality of life. No demonstrable difference in mortality. Uh, data from registries, a propensity scored uh, uh, registry systematic review by El Sayed and colleagues in NDT this last year really confirms that generally more cost effective than hemodialysis, but that does depend on local circumstances and uh, lower risk of transmission of infection, respiratory as in the case of COVID-19 and also bloodborne. And just turning to the pandemic, what was the impact of the pandemic on dialysis populations? On the left-hand panel, you can see the data from our own unit. You can see that um, about 20% of our center-based hemodialysis patients uh, became infected with COVID-19 during the pandemic, whereas for the peritoneal dialysis population, that was uh, around 10%. In the right-hand panel, a paper published in JSON by Richard Corbett and colleagues from Imperial College London. And again, you can see the impact on the dialysis population in the upper panel and on the dialysis nurses. And that's a key component here that nursing staff and medical staff also became infected during this pandemic. Here's data from the UK Renal Registry up to the end of the first wave in the UK. In the top panel, you can see the cumulative COVID-19 cases. And here we've got um, home therapies, 3.1% in England, for example, becoming infected with COVID by that stage, whereas for center-based hemodialysis, that was 11.5%. And then if we look at mortality in the lower panel, 1.1% of home therapies patients had died of COVID during that phase, uh, whereas 2.6% of in-center hemodialysis patients. So clearly 
a greater toll was taken among centre-based haemodialysis patients than those who were able to dialyse at home. And the final slide in this series is data from Italy, and you can see the case fatality rate for those haemodialysis patients who became infected during the pandemic of around 33.8 per 100 patients. So clearly very significant. And this clearly had a serious impact on patients, both in, their, in terms of their experience of care and in their mental health. So on the left-hand side of this survey that was circulated by Kidney Care UK, um, I put Kidney Research UK, I mean Kidney Care UK in May 2020 actually, you can see about two thirds of respondents uh, described having their care disrupted during the pandemic. And on the right-hand panel, more than four in 10 of patients felt their mental health had been affected, feeling anxious, lonely, isolated uh, as a consequence. So clearly here's this young man presenting against this context, and it's a major concern to try to get home. So what is Urgent Start PD? Here's a definition taken from a nice review by Peter Blake and Ash Jane and C. Jason in 2018. It's a strategy whereby people with advanced kidney disease who urgently and unexpectedly need dialysis due to, ure due to uremia and fluid overload can be treated with PD rather than hemodialysis. This, of course, excludes acute kidney injury. Now, in the first part of the pandemic, a number of different organisations came together to produce guidelines, and we were um, not alone in doing so. This is actually guidance from um, a, a document for the British Renal Society and the Renal Association. I'm sorry about this um, reference at the bottom of the slide. Uh, Crabtree reference that's not related to this. Um, I pasted on top of it, I apologize. But here you can see in that uh, guideline, um, we recommended PD, including urgent start as a dialysis option. And we also talked about the importance of catheter placement pathways being prioritized because many routine surgeries were being canceled at that stage. It was essential that um, catheter placement, placement was not regarded as routine surgery. And indeed, we were able to clear um, theatre spaces for that uh, during the pandemic, and that enabled people getting home uh, enormously. But also the use of medical insertion, percutaneous catheter insertion, was also very relevant. And on the right-hand side, I put a picture of Elaine Bowes from King's, who's done more than a 1,000 percutaneous PD catheters herself. She's a, uh, a specialist nurse. And then also in that document, we prioritised the importance of urgent start. This is from um, a, a report in AJKD by Arsh Ghaffari in 2012. And he's developed an algorithm where patients present late without a plan for dialysis. Uh, they're stratified according to whether they require urgent hemodialysis, such as the patient I'm describing here. But even after that, they can receive renal replacement therapy education and then can make a choice and move promptly across to PD or continue hemodialysis. Or alternatively, if dialysis can be delivered urgently by peritoneal dialysis, that provides another route in to um, urgent start PD. And here's a, an algorithm in terms of um, working through that pathway. So the patient requires to be identified. It's important to have responsive mechanisms that are able to you enable you to provide education to the patient, their carers and their families. So that requires uh, organization and having the, the personnel available to do so, to provide information promptly. And that enables uh, a modality choice, the response of insertion of a PD catheter. So that requires the ability to place PD catheters within 48 hours and indeed within 24 if possible. And then the acute start PD schedule can commence. This is from the uh, option study, which was conducted in Europe about five years ago now. And it was an educational program for unplanned start. And as you work your way through the uh, strobe diagram there, you can see that um, 270 individuals enrolled for the study. There were people who presented late uh, requiring dialysis. Of those, 214 received education, 203 completed that education, 
177 individuals who've been educated in dialysis modality options made a choice of whom 103 chose PD. So what this option study showed was that by able, being able to provide responsive education to people who present late, many people will choose uh, a home therapy. And then one has to initiate the therapy with an appropriate prescription. I've taken this slide from up to date from a, a review by Ash Jafari, um, but actually uh, there's also a really lovely review in the uh, ISPD Acute Kidney Injury Guideline published this year. So essentially, one needs to use low volumes supine in the first phase, advise the patient that they mustn't be um, up and about when they've got fluid in, in order to minimize risk of leaks, secure the catheter, um, educate the patient uh, through this process, and so on. And there's multiple publications demonstrating that you can successfully manage um, uremia and volume overload in this way. One needs to be cautious about patients who are hypercatabolic and they may require hemodialysis, but for many, um, acute PD can be used uh, and um, good examples of this throughout the pandemic. So just another uh, slide uh, from Gafari's work here just summarizing five key elements to a successful urgent start PD program. Ability to place PD catheters promptly. Staff education so that the staff know how to use those catheters, catheters safely using appropriate prescriptions. Administrative support is necessary um, to enable getting that person home and getting the care they need. Um, Identification of suitable candidates, that means being ready to check the ward in the morning and find out who might be eligible. Protocols to describe every step of the pathway. And of course, decision support that's individualized to enable that decision making. So what's the evidence around unplanned start? I'll just show you three slides on this. Here's a study from Brisbane, Emily C and others. And you can see they divided their group according to unplanned um, start um, less than two weeks um, catheter use less than two weeks after insertion to more than two weeks looking at complications in the first four weeks and you can see uh, you know a greater risk of exit site infection or catheter migration in this early start group so there is an increased burden um, using the catheter early but that's a manageable increase in burden when one balances that against the um, consequences of using a tunneled central venous catheter and you can see no, difficult, no difference here in peritonitis-free survival, for example. This slide comes from uh, China. And again, we've got uh, a group of individuals requiring urgent start dialysis, or urgent start hemodialysis. And you can see, whereas there's a, a low increased risk of peritonitis in the urgent start PD group, there's this risk of catheter-related infection in the urgent start hemodialysis group. Overall, Factors for short term dialysis related complications by logistic regression analysis, urgent start HD had a greater risk than urgent start PD. So, evidence for the benefit of starting urgently on PD, or at least showing that it doesn't disadvantage patients if they're carefully selected and well managed. That's the survival curve. And then, moving across to this paper published recently in PDI from Danielle Ponce's group in uh, Brazil, and again looking at her group that started urgently on PD versus HD. And you can see some differences really overall. The one that they wanted to point out actually um, was um, recovery of uh, diuresis, uh, more prominent in the PD group, interestingly. A catheter-related nine infection, obviously more prominent in the hemodialysis group. Overall infections seem to be quite high actually in both these groups. This is exit site infection or peritonitis or catheter related infection in about 60% or so of this patient group. So clearly one has to take real steps to minimize the risks of infection. And then here's an economic evaluation from Peritoneal Dialysis International several years ago, 2014. And it makes the case that, that uh, urgent start PD is more cost effective than urgent start HD for the primary reason that urgent start HD requires two forms of access. You've got the initial access that's the catheter and then permanent access required in terms of the fistula, whereas the PD catheter 
turns out to be the permanent access, and that's a distinct advantage. So moving to the section on supporting patients during the pandemic on PD, here's a paper from Claudia Ronco and his group from Vicenza. And it's one of a number of papers that described uh, managing patients remotely using uh, telephone consultation, but also using re remote uh, monitoring on APD. Uh, that's the Baxter Share Source system. And uh, here you can see uh, an algorithm they had for um, patients presenting uh, at the center who um, were being treated on peritoneal dialysis. And the point that they made was it's really important to have pathways of care so that patients could be triaged and managed independently of uh, other patients in the hospital and get home quickly, depending on their COVID-19 uh, status. But you can see as part of this algorithm, uh, remote monitoring uh, is key, getting them back home as soon as possible. And indeed, most of the guidelines, including the ISPD guideline on this and others, uh, focused on key aspects uh, of how to manage patients remotely during this time, particularly thinking about, you know, how do you avoid complications, being aware of the need to uh, see patients when you need to, um, diagnose and infection promptly, and so on. So it requires a skill set which, we, which we've been developing during the last year. And indeed, a group in North America and Canada, USA and Canada, put together this document in HAKD, uh, fairly recently looking at the landscape of home dialysis telehealth and in this schema you can see a number of domains on the left we've got the stakeholders to consider patients carers the clinic workers the payers the regulators top we've got barriers and concerns some of those are technical thinking about internet connectivity technology literacy for some people they're not used to using uh, it in this sort of way concerns about privacy issues, uh, how one integrates this into the clinical workflow, for example. On the bottom section, we've got some of the real advantages. So for example, keeping people um, in the community, managing them remotely, being proactive about developing complications rather than reactive, um, and incorporating that into the multidisciplinary team work. And then thinking ahead uh, on the right-hand side there, how do we learn from what we've had and try to integrate this most effectively into healthcare management going forward. And then two papers that evaluate patient experience of remote patient monitoring and clinician experience. This first one, uh, they're both by Rachel Walker and her group from New Zealand, talks about the clinical experience, uh, the clinician experience of remote monitoring. And the domains you can see there, first of all, enhancing patient-focused care, in other words, um, reducing time delays uh, and financial burden for the patient in accessing care. So being able to identify problems as they develop, um, enabling data driven decisions. So again, being able to see information as it accrues and respond to it rather than being reactive as I mentioned before, using it to promote and maintain peritoneal dialysis. In other words, enabling a greater sense of confidence about being managed at home uh, the, the individual at home feeling better supported, but then also being clear about the boundaries for use, you know, when and where and how, and what about privacy, whose responsibility, etc. <coughs> and then if we move into the next paper from the same group, looking at the patient and caregiver's experience, and I think at the middle of that is reduced patient burden, you know, greater reassurance, uh, convenience, accuracy, uh, improving access to treatment, but then there's also this concern that remote monitoring is important, but that must not be at the expense of face-to-face -face care when it's necessary. So this needs to be built into the context of caring for patients um, effectively in the community. So to summarize, going back to our patient, um, our young man had his catheter placed under general anesthetic, not percutaneously. He was discharged home to commence low volume automated peritoneal dialysis and attended for a couple of days in the outpatient area for some cycling PD while he was trained. And remote monitoring gave us confidence. Now, she used some data from Baxter Share Source, a representative data which shows his catheter working well, blood pressure coming under control as we managed that remotely. And then during that pandemic, our PD program grew from 51 
to 75 patients. So you can see the impact of being able to do this uh, really has had a benefit uh, on the PD program and on our patients. So to summarize, I'll just go back to that review by Peter Blake and Ash Jane um, to say that catheter placement, um, nurse coordination uh, to run the program, um, nursing um, teams available to counsel patients and families. So you require uh, organizational detail to provide an urgent start program. PD training needs to occur early so that care can be moved to the home. And of course, this can disrupt routine training schedules. In other words, being unable to plan for it because patients present unexpectedly. Training nurses may need to make more frequent home visits. Um, from the patient point of view, the uncertainty and the need to adapt and learn a new technique uh, while the patient's feeling unwell. And clearly supports required and assisted um, PD uh, with visiting nurses can be really helpful. So I hope I've been able to present a case um, of an individual presenting late, uh, requiring dialysis, uh, an unplanned way requiring dialysis during the pandemic, how we were able to respond to that, some of the technologies that we were able to use, some information about unplanned dialysis start and why that was important during the pandemic. Many thanks for your interest. I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you, Martin, for a clear talk, a third clear talk. I think we have time for a few short questions and short answer, one for each of the three speakers. Let's start with Carol. I see here a question from the audience, and uh, I think it's a it addresses an important. How do you persuade regulatory systems in certain countries, I would say probably in all of them, to move away from arbitrary targets to assess dialysis quality or maybe other topics relevant to the start of dialysis. Carol, any magic clue in that respect? That's a complex question, of course, but... Uh... Uh, uh, look, um, I had trouble understanding the question, but I think it was more about uh, metrics yeah. of start analysis versus um, symptomatology. Um, and I think that uh, the world has moved away from starting uh, dialysis at a specific GFR because uh, it, it, that's different for every person. Um, so I think people are much more uh, aligned now to starting dialysis when patients have symptoms or indeed when the biochemistry demonstrates that there should be a you know a dialytic intervention such as hyperkalemia acidosis fluid overload etc uh, I, I really don't think that there's any evidence that people should be starting dialysis at a specific um, estimated gfr yeah sure and your contribution in that respect was was key the and and that that whether that is true country by country i mean uh, but changing the metrics will be a long-term effort uh, in many countries, but uh, okay. I think it's happening. I, I, you can see a trend that there is yeah. a increase in, uh, in the GFR at which uh, yeah. people are seeing dialysis now. Uh, thank you, uh, Carol. A short question for, for Jenny. There was a question about the importance of the dialysis sodium. Of course, that's a, that's a broad topic. A short question, short answer, if feasible. Otherwise, the paper, as you said, is available. If feasible. Sure. Yes. So dialysate sodium is certainly a, a source of exogenous sodium that our patients are exposed to. Um, in general, in terms of intermediate outcomes, using a higher dialysate sodium, which I would define as 138 or above, is associated with higher blood pressure and higher interdialytic weight gain. However, at the trial level and just published last year in Jason was the SOLID trial, which was an individually randomized trial looking at dialysate sodium of 135 versus 140. Um, they saw no difference in left ventricular hypertrophy and a number of cardiac outcomes. However, they did see an increased risk of intradialytic hypotension with the lower dialysate sodium. Um, and so what this suggests is it may be that, that there's not a one dialysate sodium that's correct for all patients. And we have to think about underlying uh, cardiac comorbidities and patients that are prone to intradialytic hypotension or hemodynamic instability 
lowering dialysate sodium, particularly below a level of 137, may actually cause harm. Um, there is um, a pragmatic randomized trial that's ongoing now that will hopefully help us with this question. In that particular trial, clinics are randomized um, to dialysate sodiums of 137 and 140, which I think is probably a more relevant uh, clinical question right now. And, and good news, we need more evidence, so more evidence may come from that uh, pragmatic trial. Thank okay. you, Jenny. Uh, Martin, you, you mentioned, I mentioned that you are co-chairing the ongoing, still ongoing uh, controversies conference on home dialysis. Some preliminary lessons from that as yet, of course, it's not yet final, but, uh, or any... So the conference is focusing around the different rele relevant factors involved here. So we think about the individual, we think about the facility, we think about the healthcare system and also the health economics. And in my talk, I just covered a number of the different components that, that need to be included, such as the evidence around assistance uh, in, in terms of uh, assisted PD, the contextual issues around the world. And these are really, really challenging as well. So we need, we'll, in the end, like, like Jenny uh, and her, her controversies conference on volume, we'll come out with highlighting the controversies, where the evidence gaps lie, where some of the paradoxes are, and indeed, we need to really be very sensitive to the contextual issues in, in all of this. But, but broadly, we will we'll be collating um, the evidence as it stands and then putting forward uh, you know, questions for ongoing research. Um, I think it's going to be really valuable to try and draw all this together in this document. So uh, we've got a really enthusiastic um, body of individuals working in four work streams, and uh, that's moving forward. So the, the, the meeting is the first part of the second weekend of May, roughly. Uh, it's, it's all virtual, but we've had a lot of breakout groups virtually, and then the paper will, will, be, will come out of that. So uh, I look forward to sharing with that with you in due course. So like the virtual WCN, it's feasible in those pandemic days. Okay, yeah. I think it's now time to close the session. Uh, thank uh, the three speakers and the audience and wish you all uh, another good session and uh, next sessions of the WCN21. Have a good day all. Thank you.